There are verses in the Bible that are easily appreciated and generally accepted by most, if not all, religious-minded people. And to us, and even to them, they are verses that perhaps we have memorized from our youth or memorized because of constant reminding ourselves or constant reading of these verses. And because of that, and that general acceptance, these verses that would fit in this category are good places to start when we study with friends who are of different denominational faiths. In extending them an opportunity to see the difference between the truth as preached by the church we read about in the New Testament and the teaching preached perhaps at a denomination. And one such passage that we read that has such general acceptance in the religious world but has such great meaning and impact that could help convert an individual and a good place to start is Matthew 11 verse 28 through verse 30 where Jesus gives the great invitation come unto me come unto me he continues, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When Jesus spoke these words, there were great multitudes round about him, following him. They were a people who were oppressed by their government. They were oppressed by their religious leaders. They were oppressed by their own neighbors and peers. It was a time of political, moral, and social unrest. Sound familiar? <laughs> the people were laboring under heavy loads and heavy burdens of a Roman dictatorship and they were not being treated fairly by those whom they would refer to as brethren the Romans took heavy taxes from all conquered people the Jews were no exception perhaps however they were overly oppressed and overly taxed The Bible teaches to give honor to whom honor is due and that give that to Caesar which is Caesar's. But there is a, a line where it becomes immoral to burden the people with such heavy taxation. In Matthew chapter 23, the straw that may have broken the camel's back was when their own leaders showed that they were not in accordance with them. That they would prefer the political protection of the Roman government rather than to support and defend their own people. And it's with all this in mind that Jesus says these loving words. Come to me. In this passage, we can be comforted because of the enormous gravity that was being placed on the people of Jesus' day and in our own day when people need comfort and solace and refuge. 
But it is also a good place to start and study with individuals who have a religious background, but who are far from the truth. And that such a passage is loved by many in the religious world. And when considering this as we study, we point out first that this great invitation to come unto me by necessity implies a separation. No man need to come to Jesus unless he has been separated from Jesus to start with. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, the Bible tells us it is sin and iniquity which separates us from God. That separation is of our own doing, our own action. It's not God that cannot hear or God that cannot see or God that cannot save. Nothing in God's character is lacking. It is man who separates himself from God and separating himself from the law of God. In fact, God did everything He could to make reconciliation possible between man and Himself. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Romans 5.8, In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God is merciful and desires that all people come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. But with all that said, many in the religious world want more. It is more than unfair to say that Jesus has met us halfway. It's unfair because Jesus came much further than halfway, didn't He? He left His throne in heaven. He put on flesh to become man, made Himself lower than the angels. He endured persecution like no other. He fulfilled the law of Moses having no sin. He took upon Himself the guilt and the conviction of our sin and died for those sins though He be sinless. Taking those sins upon Him as if guilty but not. Paying the price for our sin when it was our sin that nailed Him to the cross. Being raised from the dead by the glory of His Father. Leaving us a, a church, a place where the saved could abide. A plan of entrance into that church whereby one might be saved. A plan by which one can be reconciled back to God, which includes faith, repentance, confession, and water baptism. And then ascended to His throne in heaven to serve over that kingdom as the head of that kingdom. Jesus came much further than halfway to meet us to reconcile us together, didn't He? Many today want Jesus to come. Well, Jesus came. Now He calls upon us to come, right? Jesus came. God gave his only begotten Son, John 3, verse 16. And when He came to this earth, He called upon us to meet Him. Not halfway, because He came much further than halfway. In John chapter 1, John bears witness of the eternal light, the eternal word. In verse 9 he says, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cameth into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Now notice verse 11. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Jesus came, didn't He? He came and called upon us to come. And the Bible said He came to His own. That is, His own people. Those He created. 
and they received him not. They didn't come. They, didn't, they weren't interested in meeting him halfway. They weren't even interested in meeting him part of the way. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus speaks a parable. And in verse 2, he says, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king who made a marriage for his son. Now notice verse 3. And he sent forth his servants to call them who were bidden to the wedding. Now the Bible tells us today that people are called to salvation by means of the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14. And this parable is like the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. The Father is offering to invite people to a wedding. And He sends out an invitation, right? Come to the wedding. And notice, verse 3, they would not come. <laughs> they would not come. Now, isn't that interesting? Jesus' simple invitation, a, a verse that almost all individuals in the religious world have respect for in some manner, where Jesus says, Come unto Me. And many in the religious world want Jesus to go much further than He ever did. And in fact, Jesus went as far as He possibly could without doing it for us. He did everything He possibly could without actually obeying the Gospel on our behalf. He left us one small part Believe on Him and obey Him. He did the rest. And the Bible yet tells us that even though He came and did so much that when He invited people to come, the Bible says they would not come. So also implied in this, if we were to study with our religious friends, is not only that man has a responsibility, God has done His part, man has a responsibility, but man can reject that responsibility and not come. That just because the invitation is offered does not mean men will be saved. That men will choose not to be saved. They will choose to reject the invitation. They will choose to not come. So the implication necessitated by this verse is that man separated not because of anything God did. God did everything He could to reconcile. But also man, in separating himself from God, chooses whether to come back or not. Man has a responsibility in regards to his salvation. Will he receive the call? Will he accept the call? One cannot be saved by the call if he does not receive it. And he cannot be saved by the call if he does not accept it. But it's also intriguing as to who the call was given to. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Everybody that Jesus was speaking to in that day understood. That means me. <laughs> in some form or fashion this call is to me. Everyone was overburdened in some form or fashion and was in need of solace, in need of peace, in need of rest. And so God offered His invitation to all. Now there are those in the religious world who read a verse like this where Jesus said, Come unto me all, ye that labor and are heavy laden, yet say that there are those who are not called to be saved, that God has called certain individuals to be saved and left others out. the Calvinistic doctrine of predestination. That certain individuals were predestined to be saved and certain are predestined to be lost. When Jesus in this great simple invitation says that the invitation is to all who labor and toil. How hard is it for someone to be repulsed by such an invitation? <laughs> that they would choose not to accept this grand and gracious, right? Most gracious invitation. Come to me all ye who labor and are heavy laden. In Jesus' day, the perhaps the primary workforce was made up of farmers, 
carpenters, fishermen, men that labored in the hot sun with their hands. They labored and toiled in the sand, in the hot. But then there were those who were dealing with self-imposed burdens, right? Some burdens we have are because of things that we have done on our own. But this invitation was to all. Not just to a few. Jesus didn't die for just a few. He died for all. And all men have an opportunity to receive this call to come to Jesus. But then, he says in verse 29, Take my yoke upon you. Now he says what his yoke is when he says, And learn of me. The yoke of Christ is not like the yoke that men or farmers would put upon their beast of burden to plow their fields. That yoke would be used to force the animal into a path that the farmer would want it to go, to keep it guided straight, to keep it in the way, to keep it in the path, to keep it from trampling the ground that was planted and to make sure that the beast went its way. You know, if you leave a beast to itself, it's going to act like a beast. <laughs> you never know what it's going to do, right? You don't know what animals are going to do. They don't have uh, sense, in the, right? They don't have uh, common sense in the, in, the, in the sense that they have the ability to reason or make logical decisions. Now they have an innate sense. They make sure they can eat and drink and stay alive. They know where to go for protection, to hide, and things of that nature. There are certain innate things that they're born with. But if you leave them to themselves, they're not going to go the right path. The right path. And so Jesus says, all you laborers and are heavy laden, I'm going to give you rest. And how are you going to get that rest? Probably no one thought what he was going to say next would be take my yoke upon you and work. <laughs> but he did. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now if Jesus wanted every individual to accept this invitation and be saved, and he does, and uh, there was nothing a man could do in regards to his salvation, he could have easily said, all things are done, all things are taken care of. But he said, take my yoke upon you. Once again, pointing out that man has a responsibility, man has a role to play in regards to his own salvation. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says in verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. This is the lifestyle you ought to live in order to re remain a faithful man of God. But then notice verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. Do you know you have the opportunity to lay hold on eternal life? You have opportunity to take Jesus' yoke upon you and receive rest. To be guided by the Savior. To be taught by the Savior. To know His will, to know His words, to obey them, and to be blessed by them. One can take that yoke upon Him and lay hold on eternal life. 
For any individual who worries about whether he is saved or not, listen to the words of the inspired apostle. You can lay hold on eternal life. You can, and when you lay hold on something, you know you have it. Now obviously we don't have it in the sense that we're eternally saved at that point in time, but we have it in promise. And we know that God's promises are faithful. God cannot lie. Titus chapter 1, 1 and 2. God fulfills all His promises. And so when God tells us we can lay hold on eternal life, we can do just that. But it shows that we have a role to play. We have a responsibility to play. We have to take the yoke. We have to take the, the teaching mechanism given to us by Jesus, His Word. And we have to apply it to our lives. We have to apply it to our heart. And when we do that, we will flee lustful things, as Paul told Timothy, and fill our lives with righteousness and faith, patience. Good things, right? And then the gift you shall find rest unto your souls. Now that's what everybody wanted in Jesus' day, wasn't it? That's really all they wanted was rest. They were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. They were being persecuted by their neighbors. They were being persecuted from within. They were being persecuted from the, the religious leaders who were taking advantage of them. All they wanted was rest. And Jesus said, I can give you rest. And for all those who are burdened under heavy labor and toil. I can give you rest. Obviously the rest is not a rest in this life from turmoil or work. That wasn't the rest Jesus was talking about. The rest He was talking about was eternal rest. Heaven. Just as Canaan was a place that would fulfill every need and flow with milk and honey, the eternal place of heaven, the eternal Canaan, would have that same restful, peaceful being. It is that that God offered. The rest that God offers in eternity is not a rest that can be transferred to someone else. <laughs> you can't receive the gift of rest and then re-gift it. <laughs> Every individual has to accept this gift on Jesus' terms. Every individual has to accept this call to take the yoke upon themselves. You cannot take the burden upon yourself to give anyone rest just as they could not take the burden away from you. And then, as if Jesus, and of course He did, had forethought and knowledge that there would be those who would say, I really love this idea of coming to Jesus. And I really love this beautiful invitation to have my burdens taken away and to be given rest. But this taking of yoke, that sounds a lot like I'm working myself to heaven. Jesus continues in verse 30 and says, My yoke is easy. And my burden is light. <laughs> God didn't ask us to do much, in other words. God's not asking us to do any more than what is reasonable for someone who is appreciative for such a gift, is He? 
as I mentioned, Jesus came much further than halfway to meet us in reconciliation. He came much, much further than halfway. Our response then is a response of whether or not we appreciate what He's done. We love Him for it. That's truly our response, isn't it? His burden is light. His yoke is easy. To come to Jesus means to come hear His Word, believe it, and obey it. That's what it means to take the yoke upon ourselves and learn of Him. And that's how we receive rest to our souls in eternity. It's not much to ask. It's a light burden and an easy yoke. The invitation, words of beauty and comfort, offering a gift that only God Himself can give, offered to all men who will accept men who labor, men of all nationalities, men of all status, workers of the field, those with heavy burdens. The invitation is all to all. And the good thing is Jesus' invitation is still extended today. Any individual who wants to come to Jesus can do just that. They can take His yoke upon them, learn of Him, and follow Him. Initially, when one takes the yoke of Christ upon him, he'll find that he has to hear the Word of God in order to build faith. That faith is impossible, or it is impossible to please God without faith. That faith can be dead, that faith can be vain, but the only faith that saves is a living, active faith. A faith that repents of past sin, a, a faith that confesses the deity of the Christ, and a faith that is willing to be baptized in water to have one's sins washed away. The Lord adds those individuals to His church where He expects us to continue to wear the yoke and to continue to work in His fields to continue to work in His kingdom, to continue to work, to continue to labor and toil, remembering that His yoke is easy and His burden is light and the gift is eternal rest. If you've already obeyed those initial acts but have separated yourself once again, remember that God has made a plan for you to be reconciled back to Him. As Jesus said to the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, as we studied this morning, go and sin no more. Ask God to forgive you. And He will. Whatever your need is, if it's of a private nature, take care of it privately. If it's of a public nature, we're here to assist you if we can. Come now as we stand and sing.